friends. Thank you all for coming for this tour map this morning. Uh, thanks to the BGs. I hope you make your friends to also come. We are very honored to have Dr. Lionel Nyanraj, sir, as a former medical superintendent of neurology. So, thank you for accepting our invitation. Sir, will be speaking to us about an issue which we often face when people go to mission hospitals. It's more for our younger faculty and for our PGs, who I hope will check in quickly. Uh, it's on uh, in challenges we face in mission hospitals. Uh, and I'm very also honored that Sajoy has agreed to be our chairperson for today. Sajoy has worked in OTC for a long time. So he also knows issues that are faced there. So he will be chairing our session this morning. Uh, thank you, sir, for something this Dome Bible. It has been a pleasure for us and we are enjoying it. And getting up in the morning has been the only challenge. So it's of physicians, <laughs> the surgeons, I see all of them running around already. Right? So I open up for uh, Thanks to Josh and John for doing the recording part of it. So thank you guys. So with those few introductions, I'll ask the joy to start the session. Thank you, sir. Good morning. Shall we start with the word of prayer? By the way, thank you for this morning as we are sitting here and learning about the challenges that many of us might face in our lives, Lord, we pray that you will help us, you will give us the wisdom, the discernment and the understanding to put it to use in our lives for the benefit of others. Thank you for being with us. In Jesus' name we pray. My friends, uh, in Corona, like, he, uh, his son was a very bright guy. And I knew that family from the long, for a long time. So I was telling him, uh, Anna, I used to call him as my elder brother. I said, Anna, you must send your son uh, to CMC because he has to study in CMC and, and uh, he'll make a lot of contribution. Then uh, you know what he said? I don't want to send him to CMC. I said, why? So he said, CMC will teach him such a lot of technology and modern medicine that he will be unfit for going out into the rural area. I still remember, but I still insisted and I bought him an application form and I sent it and Chan is still here. Uh, but it's a fact that when we get trained in a major tertiary center, sometimes going out to the periphery uh, is not so attractive. It's not so challenging. It can be frustrating. You don't have the gamut of investigation that you can lean on to say that uh, I'll be fulfilled in my life if I work outside. But then again, it's a matter of your attitude. Because I've known so many people who have taken up the challenge of reaching out to various parts of this country and who contributed a lot. Recently, uh, in Ranipet, Ranipet is just about 24 kilometers away from here, and uh, we celebrated 200 years of mission work. 200 years of mission work is when in 1819, John Scudder landed in India. Uh, he was a thriving physician in New York. In 1814, he went to one patient's house and he came across a pamphlet. And the pamphlet said, there are 600 lakh people languishing in India with no proper health care and they have not heard about Christ. That struck him very much and he told the patient, can I take this pamphlet home? Then he took it home and then he was sharing with his wife Harriet, hey, I am troubled about this. 600 lakhs of people with not much of a health care and they don't know Christ. So they started praying. And then they decided, uh, we'll go to India. He was earning quite a lot of money as a, a physician in New York. And then his father heard about it. He said, you're a fool. You can send some contribution to the heathen country and somebody else will do the work that you want to do. You are not an evangelist, you are a doctor. So you better stick to your profession. Why are you wasting your time? 
But then he, John Scala had made up his mind and he sailed with his young daughter. Soon he landed up in Calcutta. Three days later, his daughter died. She developed recently and died. And then his father wrote, You fool, you come back, you lost your precious daughter. And then John Scala had the mind to say, My God has called me and he will take thee through any difficulty. And that was the starting note of this man who started the mission work in India. And uh, we met the sixth generation of the Skada family recently, about two weeks ago, and we had a, a ceremony uh, where we celebrated 200 years of mission work. One chap, one person who pleaded to the call of God and saying, let me go. He didn't know any, any future. He never thought his granddaughter will be the founder of Scudder, uh, this CMC. He never knew that Scudder Memorial Hospital will have his bones buried there. In fact, uh, when John Scudder died in uh, Cape Town, uh, South Africa, he told in his will, my body needs to be buried in Ranipet. Because he, he had worked in Ranipet for about 25 years. And the student is there in front of our hospital, his and his wife's. Why I am starting off with this history is, history is very important because you will also fall into a history. I was just telling Tambu, I feel ancient. It is five years since I left this institution and uh, I am coming back here. And uh, uh, it is strange sometimes. Because once you retire, uh, you can be a nobody. I still remember four months after I, my retirement, I came to preach in the uh, evening service on Sunday. I was driving down the car and then the SUV stopped me at the parking slot before I entered into the parking slot and said, Nega So I said, uh, I don't know what to say because I can't be saying I worked here for 40 years. I was a medical superintendent. Uh, I retired four months ago. This guy is a new guy and he would have known and he said, Poya. He doesn't mean anything to me. So I had to tell him, uh, Sir, uh, uh, this is Dr. Mastar, that's my wife's car, and uh, I'm the driver and I'm putting it in the slot. He was very happy and he let me. <laughs> that is the worth of any person who has finished the job and gone out. I mean, you may be a big shot, your position may be very strong, you may have a, got a very good reputation. All of that is not because uh, the Bible says there are only two things which last. One is the word of God, and other one is people. People. Because we have eternity in our hearts. And that is the reason why your life should not be frittered away. At no time should you say, hey, I missed my goal by five degrees, then you're lost. Down the track you're lost, and then you say, hey, what have I done with my life? It's all been a waste. That should never happen to us because each one of us is a precious person. Precious person picked out by a great God for a great work. Otherwise, you wouldn't have been trained in a great institution like this. CMC trained person is a privileged person. Why privileged? 80% of you would not have stepped into a college like this unless you have been sponsored, unless somebody had given you some flip and pushed you into this institution and people have thrived. Once you get into the institution, it's an all-around performance. I still remember uh, Ganesh Gopalakrishnan talking about JP. When Jayaprakash Molyam, our uh, former principal, 
came into the institution, he could not speak English. He could not speak English properly. But now, you go to any of his lecture, my God, the way that he presents his lectures will be all inspired. Why? This place has trained him. This place has given us opportunities to thrive. To thrive for what? You can be selfish and keep it to yourself or you can use it for the greater purpose of medicine and God. And then you will make a significant change in each one of your lives. I think that if that can be achieved in a little way in this talk, uh, I'll be very happy and it's my prayer about it. Okay. Now, one of the questions which comes to us quite often is, uh, do we need mission to hospitals anymore in our country? Has it become irrelevant against the background of, you know, mushrooming for private, public and corporate hospitals? When you look into the history, at the time of independence, there were 750 mission hospitals. Now, about 200 are thriving. And out of the 200, we really do not know whether they have a mission or a mission. Uh, we don't know. Many of them are slowly declining into uh, some rut and away from the purpose of which it was brought, it was, uh, brought out. And so the question that comes is, uh, very relevant question, do we need mission hospitals at all? Uh, and uh, I still remember when I came for my interview in 1971, uh, there were not many cars. In the railway station, there were two ambassadors. You know ambassadors, uh, I don't know whether this younger generation would have seen ambassadors. Ambassador car. So uh, my dad and I got down and then we got into a taxi. Uh, that day said, uh, sir, you uh, uh, have to wait for some time and then he called five people and they were pushing the car. So the, the, the car had to be pushed to start. They pushed, they pushed, they pushed, it didn't start. Then we got into the second ambassador. Second ambassador, they said, sir, give, give me 10 rupees. For what? Petrol. He had to put the petrol and then only he had to go. Such was the situation uh, in 1971. But things have changed remarkably. Now each house, uh, I just went to one of the uh, middle level staff house, my daughter's house, and they were saying, uh, Appa, now all the uh, all of us have two cars park and there's no place to park. Two cars in a house was luxury 20 years ago, but it's become a necessity now. So things are changing so rapidly. So the question is, whether we need these old, archaic mission hospitals too. Is CMC still relevant? I mean, I, I have the audacity to ask this question because as a medical superintendent, uh, there was a guy, who was very vociferous guy saying, Sir, CMC should not be here. You should close the CMC. So I asked him why. He said, uh, Sir, if CMC the main reason why Apollo, Max, uh, he named several hospitals are not coming to Velour because of CMC. Because of CMC, nice hospitals have not come up. Then I said, uh, thank you sir uh, for your information. Now, uh, why have you come all the way to meet me? Sir, my mother is admitted, sir. Oh, I see. My mother is admitted. Where is she admitted? Uh, in the ICU, sir. Uh, so I see. Then he said, Sir, uh, uh, can you show some transition? I thought uh, that was the height of it. Here was a fellow who was questioning about the existence of CMC. His mother is being treated here. And he doesn't have much money, so he's come for concession. So I said, Sir, uh, no problem. We looked after your mother. But you, uh, I, I feel sorry for you because you don't know the real facts about the hospitals that you have just mentioned. If you don't cough up 20,000 rupees every day in the ICU, they will arrange a free ambulance and take you to the general hospital. That's a usual thing for any of these corporate hospitals. There are some corporate hospitals which send 
these gundas to get the money out of you from your house. And uh, one of the privileges that I have uh, got in working in CNC is treating poor people. The day that I joined in 1985, my chief called me and said, Lionel, I want you to treat poor patients. Do not send away any patient if just on the basis of money. And I've been repeating it like a parrot to all my registrars and my consultants because the principle of the world is gravity. The principle of the kingdom of God is give. Give and God will give to you. And that's a principle which you can apply in your own life in terms of your time, in terms of your talent, in terms of your treasure. You try it out and you'll find God is never a debtor. So I would say the emphatic thing, CMC is still relevant. But then there are challenges which face our uh, your uh, breakfast time is 7.30, isn't it? No problem. Huh? 7.40 to night <laughs> yes. uh, The challenges that we have is, now uh, according to the article 21 in the constitution, uh, health is a fundamental right of any Indian. But are we fundamentally right is a big question. Because the primary health center which is supposed to cater to 90% of our population is in shambles. Some places it is good, uh, like we, uh, we have the Walaja PHC, it's supposed to be the best PHC in the country. Very well equipped, standard, but now slowly deteriorating because of again private practice and lack of doctors. So uh, this 90% uh, of the problems to be solved in PHC is the dream. Actually if you look into it, if you find one doctor faithfully coming to PSC, it's a wonder. And there's a uh, attendance is by rota. Six doctors are supposed to be there. So I go on Monday and sign for all the other five. And tomorrow uh, Sijar will come and sign for me. Wednesday somebody else will come. And that is the usual practice. And uh, you'll be shocked if you get into the system that you have to go according to the system and uh, that is why it's in shambles and uh, now they have done the statistics one primary health center doctor looks after 51,000 people in India so that's uh, you know how uh, our health care is you'll be surprised that uh, what, what, in one area the PhD is languishing in the other area health sector is Boomy. There are a lot of foreign uh, uh, patients coming in. You go into global, many of the people who have liver transplants are all foreigners. Why? You get lakhs and lakhs of money and you can't get that kind of money from Indians. So Indians are deprived and the foreigners get the advantage. And uh, there's a disparity. There's a disparity. Again, our treatment are cheap. I had a knee replacement and uh, I was just going through the bills and compared to the bill in US, the same surgery I have to pay 20 times more. The same surgery I have to pay 3 times more in Singapore. So compared to that, our uh, treatment is affordable but to whom? A retired fellow like me you can have the, all the advantage but a poor man who's daily income is less than 250 rupees cannot afford a knee relief full stop training you are all privileged people you are all privileged people because you see your professors you see your associate professors you see your lecturers coming for rounds taking classes training you I have a registrar in Ranifet a very bright girl and uh, she uh, studied in one of the private 
gospel please. And uh, she was telling me about the uh, training that they received. There is no patient. If you walk into the surgery ward, 40 beds will be there, only 5 patients will be there. In the morning, the assistant professor will come, bed number 1, acute polycystitis, bed number 2, acute appendicitis, bed number 3, bowel obstruction, bed number 4, hernia, bed number 5, no patients. And these interns, 5 interns posted there, will have to write dummy records. And she has said, sir, I have given transfusion to blood, uh, dummy patients. This is happening in our country, in this state, in Chennai. This is happening. And uh, they all become doctors. Only thing is, this uh, girl happens to be an auto rickshaw driver's daughter who could make only to the private uh, general quota. Very bright girl. You give her any assignment, she is better than many of the other people. Why? Opportunities are not there for many poor people who are bright. And that way, we are very fortunate in getting the training that we have. And uh, along with this privilege, there also comes an accountability. Are we accountable? First to God and the place restrains you. Health outcomes, you find a stark divergence in our country. One of the things which made me feel sad was uh, when I see a patient coming from Dimapur, West Bengal, Patna for a simple TURP. So I asked them, hey, why do you want to come all the way? I have friends who are excellent surgeons who can do the grassroots surgery very well. And they say, sir, one, even if we spend money here in staying outside and getting the treatment much cheaper than what we can do there. Second thing they say is, so leave the money factor, trust. Trust. I cannot trust the doctors, sir. Because there is no opacity in diagnosis. There is no opacity in pain. There is no opacity in accountability. And here I find, here the, the first place that I find when I ask the doctor, Sir, uh, what is the problem? He says, I don't know. There, outside, there is nothing called I don't know. I know everything. The other fellow is a fool, I know everything. But here you say, Sir, I will have to investigate you, I will have to look at the results and then come to a conclusion and diagnosis. So there is uh, some amount of accountability, some amount of openness, some amount of confessing. I know a little bit, but I don't know everything. I am inadequate with these things. My friend knows uh, better than me, so I will refer him to him. That kind of openness and teamwork is still prevalent and I thank God for that. Now, uh, Tambu wanted me to talk about management issues and uh, some of the facts which came to me in my mind I just thought I would share for you to think about. When you go into a smaller hospital, you suddenly find yourself capitulated into positions of leadership and giving responsibility. And during that time, I think it is very important whenever issues come, please don't be presumptuous. Please look into both the sides of the story. Please don't get biased by a group of people. Please do not go into cliques. They are like this, they are like this. Be open and deal with facts. Second aspect which I found was, I learned it from Dr. Purula Varki when he was here. He was my uh, teacher in medicine, unit 2, and uh, he had a very nice way of taking people along with him. Uh, he would say, Lionel, uh, can we uh, organize an ultrasound scan? You really feel thrilled. Oh, sir, and I are going to organize. Actually, you are going to organize. <laughs> but it is a way of putting 
rather than saying, hey, you better order, or, or, or do this by tomorrow, you know. And it was a very nice way of taking us along. And uh, I found a great uh, deal of encouragement from seniors like that. Um, I know there are certain seniors when I don't fill up my history sheet, uh, their response will be one big question mark all along the sheet. And there are other uh, chiefs uh, who come and quietly write down all the findings tuck, 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 and sign their name also boldly. This is just a reminder, hey, you're not doing your work, I can do it. And that is like a slap. This question mark is not a slap. <laughs> but uh, when, when another person comes and does your work, which he is not supposed to do, you are supposed to do, you really get shamed and say, I won't let this happen. Even if I lean on a night call throughout the night, I come at 5 o'clock to the ward, fill up, take my findings, and do it. And, uh, and uh, uh, being a servant as a leader makes a lot of difference in, in uh, building up the team site, taking them along with you. There are certain times when you have to say no. You have to have guts to say no, I'm sorry, I cannot uh, comply with your request. Very often you want to be goody goody, uh, become popular, and uh, that way you will not be a good leader. If you find that there are certain things that the service has to run and there will not be much of a planning, then you have to say no. And then, fourthly, when you say something, you have to keep your promise. If you don't keep a promise, you are a liar and you are a bad boss. So please, before you make your promise, it can be done, it can be done. Think carefully and see. And if you are not able to make it, apologize, saying I, I meant it, but I am not able to do it. Now, communication is very important. Uh, I think one of the ways which I get caught very badly with my wife is, if I want to hide something, then my communication will be half-half. She calls it half uh, life, I call it half truth. Why? I am scared. If I tell the full truth, whether she will reprimand me, whether she will say, hey, you are an idiot. You don't like to hear all those. She doesn't call me idiot, but I am saying almost like that. But, if you got no, nothing to hide and you are straightforward, your communication has to be very clear, open, repetitive. For some people, they may not understand the first time that you say. And uh, you have to make it clear. Hey, I don't mind being disturbed at 2 o'clock in the night. So I want, if any patient becomes sick or dies, I want to be informed. I want to know what's happening in the ward. Because many of them get scared. Hey, what will Tampo do? What will OC do? Should I disturb sir at this time? No. In our patient care, they are more concerned about the patient than we, even though they may not be visiting the patient twice or thrice a day. And your responsibility is you are the go between the patient and the chief. And you have to be communicative. And uh, that communication is very important. Another thing is don't assume anything. Don't assume anything. Hey, this guy is against me, uh, he is trying to pulverize me. If you really feel like that, go and ask him, Sir, uh, ma'am, uh, things have not been going very well with us and uh, have I done anything to put you off? I think it is very important when you go to a mission hospital and, and there, there will be a lot of groupism. And against that background, you should be an impartial person. And then people will start respecting you for what you are. You have to understand your team. In each one of us, there is there are strengths, there are weakness. No one is perfect. No one is perfect. You have to understand that. As a leader, when you find that somebody is stuttering, somebody is uh, floundering, somebody needs your help, please, you can call them one by one places, 
talk to them, you know what all things they are going through in their own personal life, in their family, in their workplace, the difficulty they have. I think it's as a leader, you have a responsibility to understand your team. Be professional. When I say be professional, one of the things which I used to get a complaint is, especially when the patient has died or when things have not gone all right, uh, the patient relatives have come and said, Sir, the doctors are laughing, the doctors are joking, the doctors are playing on the phone, doctors were less communicative and they were not serious. If you look into the factor, the doctors may not have been laughing at them. They also might, might have cracked some joke uh, in the ICU or in front of the sick patient, which is taken very seriously by the patient's relatives. So your behavior should be, uh, you know, you, you can't be, uh, you can't let your guard down and uh, crack some jokes in front of the patients when they are sick. You cannot be looking at some movie or uh, your WhatsApp in uh, the ward. Uh, in your lunch time you can do it, but when you are on work, you have to be professional. You have to treat people courteously. Uh, if you don't know the person, you call the person sir. If you uh, don't know the lady, you call madam. You treat them with respect. You cannot be disrespectful. You cannot be disrespectful. Even if the patient is angry or the relative is angry, if you become angry, you lost, you lost your battle. There will be many instances where uh, in the MS office, just hearing them out, just letting them vent their feelings has reduced a lot of the situations. I still remember a lady, precious pregnancy. And here, they have a protocol to see that uh, you deliver the child normally. And they tried and tried and tried, and the baby died. And the baby wouldn't come out, they had to do a caesar. When they did a caesar, she had a burst abdomen. Obese, baby, all sorts of complications came, and they were really agitated. Agitated because the time they, they admitted the patient, they had told the obstetrician, Sir, please take up for surgery, pressure baby, all that. But uh, they, they had to go through the protocol and it was a mess. So four people, all of them uh, real gundas, came to the MS office and uh, there was a lawyer also. And uh, they said, you want to see the MS? I said, come. Uh, and then I listened to them. And uh, they said, we are going to file a case and uh, this is what, uh, even though it will be 10 lakhs is not going to satisfy us because uh, the mother is still sick. They have lost the baby. This baby she conceived after 9 years. We don't know whether, whether she conceive at all again. So all these issues are there. So I said, uh, so I listened to them half an hour. They are shouting and screaming and then I closed the door and I listened to them. And then after that uh, I said, I am very sorry. Uh, all I can say is, all the treatment management has been done out of good faith. We have never intended that the baby should die or the mother should go to complication. In, in good faith we have done it, but we have failed. And uh, we are very sorry about it. And uh, I don't know how to compensate. I cannot compensate the life of the baby. I can write off the bill for the mother, which is the least thing that I can do, but uh, you listen to me. You won't believe it. They said, Sir, we are so happy that you let all four of us come into your office. We are so happy that you listen to us. And we are so happy that we accept it, that uh, you have done it in good faith and, and uh, all these things have happened. And uh, we leave. We'll pay the bill and I was just thanking God because I just said, I'm sorry, 
things have not gone the right way. We meant it for good, but it turned out to be bad. All I had said was, I'm sorry, and this is the truth that I got. I didn't hide anything. And, uh, and I can say, incidents after incidents, where instead of putting up your price, you accept what you've done and say, I'm sorry, I'm willing. And uh, people have just backed off. Backed off saying, okay, it can happen to anyone. And we accept it and God graciously. And another important thing is, like I said, each one of us are made in the image of God and we are precious in the sight of God. And that applies to the beggar on the road also. He deserves respect from us. Just because he doesn't have an education, money, position, you cannot treat him like an animal. You can't treat him uh, taking him for granted. He is precious in the sight of God and you have to treat him as a child of God. When that kind of relationship develops, then your own esteem in your life will go up because you honor God. And you will find that uh, life is worth living. I just want to go into the vision statement. Christian Medical College Bello seeks to be a witness in education, service and research. I will just run through. And uh, again, uh, regarding education and training, it's uh, compassionate, professionally excellent, ethically sound individuals. And uh, I don't know how many of you know our motto. What is our motto now? CMC motto. They're all any students, huh? huh? What is our motto? What, John? Not to be minister. Huh? Not to be minister. Minister, you don't want to be minister, no. Not to be served, also. In fact, uh, God is telling about Himself. I came not to be served, but I have come to serve. And serve is the uh, underlying factor for a servant. So we are all called to be servant leaders and not, uh, you know, mega leaders. So, we are supposed to go out as servant leaders of health teams and communities. And uh, Jesus' model is the model which trained us to take up this motto. Jesus said, come to me. Come to me and then go. And uh, the whole term mission is going out. Sending out. And that Sending out, you have to come first to God. There's no two ways about it. And if you look into the background of all these Christian mission hospitals, it has been a response to the call of God. I said John Scudder read the pamphlet and he left New York and came to India. Ida Scudder heeded the calls of three women who died during childbirth and said, I must look after the women and the children of this country. So each person had a very, very specific call and it could have been for individuals or groups and uh, the need was in place. Patanjatra, when it was formed, people were eating bark, bark of the tree and eating grass because they were so poor and they had gone through a time of uh, drought. The people were dying due to famine and their life expectancy was around 30 years in that area. So Dr. Tarian and Dr. Cherian identified that place and said it's a, it's a burst drought affected area and we'll go there and serve. They were, they were both FRCS uh, surgeons. They could have gone anywhere in the world. But they chose that place and they made a difference. They made a difference that uh, people like Sajoy and others are still continuing the battle. And the whole idea of this lecture is that God has also given you a battle to carry. 
from this place. Will you be faithful to him or will you be faithful to yourself? self I, I just finished some fast flights. Now, are you going out to your hospital out of gratitude or out of duty? The time that I passed my MBBS in 78 and I got a job, I was so happy. Hey, somebody is willing to employ me and give me money. And I still remember when I got my first salary of 900 rupees, I was so thrilled. <laughs> thrilled because my measurement was 60 rupees and my expense was 30 and I didn't know what to do with the 900 or 800 levels. But the mess was from the a and school of mess. Where for the first time in my life, my breakfast was fancy and good. But then it was nice life. I enjoyed it. But then again, attitude. Now, people are going for McDonald's hmm? or uh, Pizza Hut. In Kanjibram, they travel in the night, 70 kilometers down the line. Or at 11 o'clock for the Sikhi. Hey, noodles, get pagoda. I mean, there is a mess for which you are paid. But you got a lot of money and uh, I mean, the, the affluence is there. And then once you go to a place called Italy, you say, hey, no McDonald's there, no pizza, but only kanji. But again, you look at uh, myself or others. Very important. I know it all. I am CMC trained MD. I don't know what the uh, word uh, is about. The person who knows it all. There's a saying in Tamil that says, Sattvaz kaya kalla arudu, kudal arudu. That is, kadal arudu. That is, what I know is just equivalent to what I have in my hand. But what I don't know is ocean. Are we humble enough to accept that? Very often we think that we are the top shots. We are top shots. But then we have to modify ourselves to, according to the place. Recently a guy who finished the MD OG went to a remote area in Bihar. Then he brought one rule. In CMC, we don't give antibiotics for LSCS. Full stop. So from today onwards, no antibiotics to all our LSCS patients. Now that's a very, very busy obstetric uh, unit which delivers about 500 to 600 deliveries per month. Suddenly in a month or two, the medical student had to call the obstetric student and say, Hey, any other patient is getting infected, man? What is the problem? Then what he realized, in Bihar, they don't take part. They all have the cakes of dirt on their abdomen. Here we give them betadine scrub, this scrub and that scrub and we don't need any word. But there, then he had to change his ideas very quickly. This place in Raksol, they need prophylactic antibiotic before I took my life. Better not to learn the hard way, but rather look into the situation and go patiently. Don't ever try to change a system which has been there for many years just because you learned some new thing. You fit into the system, gain the confidence of the people there and they accept it very well. I still remember when I went to Ekar to one of the CSA hospitals, two doctors were the junior doctors and they were loggerheads with each other. Loggerheads, not talking, not uh, smiling uh, and it was terrible. But I was smiling to both of them and the main reason was this guy who had been trained here is an expert on LSCS, lower segment, cesarean section. Other girl is from a government center and they were doing classical. Classical cesarean is, is out because the incidence of rupture and all the complications are more. So he said she is doing a uh, great crime. So I didn't know what to say. I knew it was a crime. But I didn't want to call it a great time. So uh, he will refuse to go and assist her 
for a season. But I used to assist both of them. And then after three months, that lady doctor asked me, Sir, uh, can you teach me how to do anesthesia? Why? Because I was not confronting her. I was not saying you are doing idiotic thing. You are doing a foolish thing. Now, who comes in? If you want to be tough, then they will act as if they are doing everything in front of you, behind you. So, interpersonal relationship is very important. One of the things which is breaking down hospitals outside us. People don't talk to each other civilly. I am greater than you. I know more than you. Please, when you work together, let it be, let oil of grace run through the relationship. Then you'll find working in any place is helpful. Then you'll find people talking to your hospital. Hey, this senior looks after his juniors very well, teaches us very well. It's concerned about my life. So, please, you know all the uh, knowledge and everything, but ask God to make you humble. And you can learn a lot of things from others also. We, uh, we can be interdependent. It's a type of I'm the boss, but the teamwork. And many of us look at instant gratification. But then you'll find that when we wait, we have a fulfilling and a, a wonderful life ahead in all these issues of this. And uh, reaching the top as soon as possible is what the world says. But what God is saying is wait. Wait and everything will work out in a beautiful manner. And uh, there are many people who say, whatever means you do, you have to succeed. But then your integrity, your honesty goes for the six. One of the things which I learned in this hospital, in this institution is that we don't pay right. We don't manipulate people. We don't uh, uh, go against the rules. We have gone into tough situations and rough situations. Tapu also might say how we used to battle groups of people. But in the end, we won. And uh, it was for the people, lesser privileged people that we fought for and uh, God was faithful to us. And uh, everyone is lazy, so why should I work hard? So the ethos of CMC has been the compassion of Christ, truth and integrity, hard work, humility, team spirit, serving the poor and downtrodden, whom the world will not look after, reaching the unreached. And I just want to finish with uh, the words of Jim Elliot. He said, uh, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. I just want to reiterate, I want to thank Tapu for giving me the opportunity. There are a lot of other specific issues of management uh, issues and uh, working things which uh, uh, I, I don't want to go into detail. But it has to start from us, our attitude, our integrity, our commitment. Even though nobody is seeing that God sees and honors. Thank you very much. Sorry, I've taken up your whole one hour. Thank you, sir, for sharing from your vast experience. Uh, maybe we have one minute for any questions or queries or anybody wants to add anything. Thank you very much, sir. That was a thing. Just that, just what we needed. Uh, it was a huge topic to cover, and you were able to bring the most important aspects. Thank you so much, sir. Let's give one more round of applause for sir. Are there any questions from any of the students or faculty? Thank you, sir. <laughs> so, I think you have any questions like that. So, thank you very much. I think that really, like you said, the change task of us are not like the change the mission of the law where we're trying to go. I hope you'll come back again and talk to us sometime in the future. So, again, yeah, I hope you enjoy the
Thank you again very much. Please join us for breakfast and tell us. No, 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 not at all. Please. So thank you all for coming. We'll have breakfast at the